we are on the last AB video. Unit eight is the last unit for AB students. There are two more units for BC students, but this is gonna be the last one AB students watch. So it is the applications of integration and that's where we end basically, um, you know, our AB journey from limits to derivatives to now integration, that's where we end. BC students have two more units, a, a bit more um, applications of calculus kind of uh, to other fields basically. But yeah, um, this there are only a few applications we have to talk about. One major one that's going to take up a big chunk of our time, but a few minor ones as well. So let's get started. Um, we're going to start off just like with derivatives with integrals in context. Uh, an integral basically represents the accumulation of change over a certain interval. And the main application, of course, is going to be uh, with physics, with position, velocity, and acceleration. So in uh, derivatives, it goes position, and then the derivative of that is velocity, derivative of that is acceleration. This is for derivatives. Now for integrals, uh, it's going to go acceleration. The integral of acceleration is velocity, and the integral of velocity is position. So this is for integrals. That's mainly what you have to remember, um, and also the fact that you can also use integrals for other accumulations. For example, you are given um, a function that represents the rate of change of people in a store. Um, you want to find the total amount of people in the store, you use integrals. Um, a lot of FRQs actually sneak stuff about uh, this in there. There's a word problem and it says accumulation, uh, find the function that represents this, find the total number of something, blah, blah, blah. Okay. Um, and then there's also going to be how you can find the average value for function using integrals. So if you have a certain function that looks like that or whatever, uh, the average value of a function you can find by adding up all the values, dividing by the total number of values. And you can use integrals to do that very precisely. If it was just like a sequence of numbers, a discrete sequence, you would just add them up and divide by the number. But for a function, you're going to say that the average value, which is represented with a bar above it, is going to be equal to 1 over b minus a times the integral from a to b of f of x dx. This is the formula for the average value of a function. And um, another word for average is mean. So you can call it the mean value of a function. And this should ring a bell in your head, the mean value theorem. Right, that was the mean value theorem for derivatives, where we um, said about the tangent line and secant line over an interval. We also have a mean value theorem for integrals. It says that if f of x is integrable uh, on the closed interval a, b, then there is a value c between a uh, and b, such that f of c is equal to this f bar, uh, which is just 1 over b minus a times the integral of a to b of f of x dx. Right? There has to be at least one value of c, such that the average value of the function is uh, the value of the function itself. Pretty interesting. Okay. Uh, and now we're going to get into the big chunk of it. It's split into three different applications, the area between two curves, the volume of revolution, uh, and then finally the arc length. But uh, the first and third ones aren't that long. It's mainly volume. That's a long uh, time. But before we talk about that, we have to talk about the area between two curves. We've been talking about the area under a curve. That's the integral. But what if you have two curves like that? How do you find the area between them? Well, as you might imagine, you're just going to find the difference of the two functions. It gets a bit complicated, though. If you're trying to find them with respect to x, so dx, you're going to have vertical slices. And so we say ax is equal to the integral from a to b of the top function minus the bottom function uh, dx, right? That's the top function, that's the bottom function. And a and b are just where the two functions intersect. Okay, uh, what if you want to use hor um, horizontal rectangles, though? Uh, that would be with respect to y. And so ay is equal to uh, integral from a to b. Uh, this time a and b are the y uh, values of the inter, um, intersecting points. And then f of y minus g of y, where f of y is the uh, right function and g of y is the left function, dy. Um, so obviously it's not the same exact function. Uh, it's going to be actually the inverse function for y, uh, but I'm just writing this function uh, just to make it easier to write. And so uh, always make sure what you're using. If you're given something like y is equal to square root of x and x is equal to y squared minus 8y plus 1, right? It looks mixed, but you can just write this as x equals y squared and make sure you limit it on the domain because um, x equals y squared is this entire thing. We only want this top part. Uh, so you can basically write in terms of y and then do it from there. Okay, uh, that is area between two curves. Now we have volume. 
And just like with area between two curves, you can either do it with respect to X or with respect to Y. We're going to start with what is called the cross-sectional method. So you have the area under a curve, um, but instead of taking that area and revolving it around someone, which is what we're usually going to do, in this case, we're basically jutting it out. We're saying that it makes up some shapes, for example, a semicircle. Uh, and if you, it's kind of hard to draw on a whiteboard, obviously, but basically you're taking each value of the function and you're extending it to three dimensions. Uh, and so the cross section at each point is going to be a certain shape that's given, like a equilateral right triangle or equilateral triangle or an isosceles right triangle, semicircle, square, something like that. And so by just using the value of the function at that point, you can find the dimensions of that, uh, you know, that cross section. And then you add up all the, um, areas of the cross sections and you get the total volume of the resulting shape. Uh, and so the two equations you're going to use, if you're doing it with respect to x, as you might imagine, it's going to be uh, integral from a to b, where a and b are the lower and upper bounds, of the a area function uh, dx. And that area function is going to be in terms of f of x. For example, if f of x is, uh, this is negative x squared plus 4, and you're doing uh, squares, which are probably the easiest ones, it's just going to be the value of the function squared, since the uh, value outside is going to be the same as the value going down, um, since it's a square. And so it's just going to be f of x squared, and then you plug that into f of x. So negative x squared plus 4 squared dx, expand, simplify, whatever. Um, you know the drill. Okay, and then you can do the same thing with y, you say v y is equal to the integral from a to b, again, different a and b, uh, and this is a of y dy. Okay, uh, hopefully I made that clear enough. It's really hard to do on a whiteboard, especially through a video instead of like an actual lecture. Uh, and so, of course, if you have any questions, just uh, let us know in the comments below. But um, this uh, is probably going to be one of the most or hardest to learn. Um, it's not too bad if you do enough practice problems about it. So that's what I'm going to advise you to do. Just do a bunch of problems about volumes, um, just cross section. And then the other methods we're going to learn as well. Uh, just drill this in your head because while it's not that common on the AP exam, it's hard to learn, um, harder than other concepts. Cause you, it's hard to visualize 3d things in your head, uh, and on your paper and things like that. Okay. That's volume by cross section. The other three, uh, Value, ways to find the volume are by revolving it around an axis. And so usually the axis is going to be either the x-axis or the y-axis, but it could be something like a horizontal line or a vertical line or something like that. Uh, that is not the x and y-axis. Uh, we're going to talk about the x and y-axis for now, but you can change the formulas to uh, modify it and or to use a different axis instead. And so we're going to start with what's called the disk method. Uh, and so you only have one function there, um, and you have these certain rectangles, the disk method, each slice of area corresponds to a disk when revolved around uh, an axis that's perpendicular to the slice, keyword there. If you have a vertical rectangle, you, uh, you're going to revolve it around the x-axis, or probably, this is probably a better way to say, it. if you're revolving around the x-axis, you're going to use a vertical rectangle. Um, if you're revolving around the y-axis, you're going to use a horizontal rectangle, and so on. Uh, and so the disk method basically creates these disks, like these cylindrical disks. Uh, and you just add up the volumes of each of these cylindrical disks. You're going to get uh, the integral, or Vx in this case, is going to be from a to b of pi times the function squared dx. And that's because all you're doing is creating this circle. Um, it's technically a cylinder uh, with the radius f of x. And the area of a circle is going to be pi f of x squared. And then you're extending it by an infinitesimally small amount dx. And so the volume would be pi times f of x squared times dx. Okay. Uh, and then y, you can adapt it to the same thing. A, b, uh, pi, and this is f of y squared dy. Okay. Uh, now, what if you have two functions, right? You have this function here, and then you have uh, this function there. What if you want to revolve this area around the x-axis? And uh, keep in mind, you can also revolve around the y-axis. If you were to revolve around the y-axis in this case, uh, you would use um, y. You would have this, and then you would... Uh, usually, it doesn't go over to the other axis. This is just a bad example, but I drew it already. Uh, and so you would have this kind of um, 
circle or cylinder, uh, and so you would use horizontal rectangles, f of y. So that's where you would use v of y. Okay, in this case, uh, let, let's say you're revolving on the x-axis, um, you're going to have these slices, and then when you revolve it, you're going to have that outer radius and this inner radius. And so this is called the washer method because you have an outer and inner radius uh, and the area between those radii is really the area you want. And washers look like that. So it's called the washer method. This is the disk method. This is the washer method. And so they're very similar. Here, the volume is going to be integral from A to B of pi times the outer radius f of x squared minus the inner radius g of x squared dx. <laughs> And so v of y is equal to integral from a to b of pi times um, integral uh, times f of y squared minus g of y squared dy. Very similar again. Uh, you'll notice pattern with all these. It's going to be very similar to each other. Okay, uh, and this is uh, going to be revolved around the x-axis. With the y-axis, you would use y uh, because keynote here. For both disk and washer method, the slice of the area uh, is perpendicular to the axis. So if you're having around the x-axis, it's going to be vertical slices. Around the y-axis, horizontal slices, and so on. And finally, what if you want to revolve around the y-axis, but you want to use uh, vertical rectangles? It's just so much easier to use V of x formulas, right? Uh, let's say you have this, again, um, uh, probably a better... Uh, function would be here, right? You want to use horizontal rectangles. It's just so much easier. And that makes sense. If this is something like negative x squared plus 2x plus 8, for example, obviously that's not the function. It doesn't make sense here. But you cannot solve for x. You cannot use vertical rectangle, uh, horizontal rectangles. And so if you want to revolve around the y-axis, you use cylindrical shells. Here, each slice of area corresponds to a thin hollow cylinder when revolved to an around an axis parallel to the slice and so what uh is created is this cylinder kind of shape um it's not uh like a cylinder that's filled in it's hollow thin walled and so all you want is basically um the volume of this thin walled cylinder you can just take that using the circumference times dy uh and so well circumference times the height times dy uh and so what you're going to do here is if you're using vertical uh, rectangles and so in terms of x it's going to be from a to b and then what's the formula for a circumference of a circle that's just 2 pi r in this case it's going to be 2 pi x uh, and then times the height which is f of x uh, and that's it dx because that's the really really thin uh, wall of the cylinder and you can do something similar for y if you're revolving on the x-axis and you want to use horizontal rectangles you're going to do uh, v of y is equal to integral from a to b of 2 pi y times f of y dy that's it. Uh, know these formulas. Don't memorize them. Know how to use them uh, is what I would recommend. Do a bunch of practice problems about volume specifically. It's hard to grasp at first, but once you do it, it's easy. Uh, and also, all I've been talking about is revolving on the x-axis or y-axis. You can revolve around the uh, equation x equals 2, y equals negative 4, and so on. So my challenge to you is to derive expressions for those or just at least solve problems using axes other than the x and y-axis. Uh, it's too much to cover in this video. This is just supposed to be a quick content review. Uh, I'm just explaining the methods of doing it. You apply it to a particular scenario. So if you're revolving around y equals 2, do not use one of these formulas I showed you. Adapt it to make it um, one of those axes. Okay, that's it for content review for AB. There's one topic for BC, very short topic. So AB, you're not missing much this time. Uh, so yeah, AB, skip ahead to practice problems. BC, stay with me for a second. We're going to be talking about arc length. If you have a function, what is the length of this uh, function? A distance the particle travels if it travels around that um, curve. And so this length is going to be equal to the integral from a to b of the square root of 1 plus dy dx squared dx. Uh, and so you just write an equation for the derivative of the function. You plug that in here, square it, 1 plus that, square root of that, dx. Plug in your calculator if it's easy to solve without a calculator, solve it without a calculator. Uh, and so that is just it. That is arc length uh, in a nutshell. <clears throat> yeah, like I said, AB didn't much miss much uh, when they skipped ahead. So it's time for our practice problems. We have uh, these three problems here. And so um, the all three of them are for AB and BC. So if you're AB, come on, stay here for the entire video. Um, so 
Find the value of c as stated in the mean value theorem for integrals for f of x equals x cubed on 2 to 4. Uh, and so the, the average value of the function is going to be 1 over b minus a, which is 4 minus 2, times the integral from 2 to 4 of um, f of x, which is x cubed dx. You can use a calculator on this. You do not need to. You absolutely do not need to. It's a very simple integral. And um, let's assume this is on a no calc uh, section. And so this is just 1 half times the integral from 2 to 4 of x cubed dx. Well, integral of x cubed using the power rule is just 1 fourth times x to the power 4. Um, and then we evaluate from 4 to 2. So that's just 1 half of... Um, well, when you put in 4, you get 4 to the power of 4, which you might want to use a calculator for. Uh, you can do it without a calculator. It's just going to be 2 to the power of 8. It's 256. But you do have to divide that by 4, giving you 64. Minus 2 to the power of 4 is 16. Divide by 4 is 4. Uh, and so 1 half of 64 minus 4, 1 half of 60, which is 30. And so that's not what it's asking us for. It's asking us for um, the value of c, such that the value of the function at this point is equal to the average value. If the average value is 30, well, x uh, well technically c cubed is equal to 30. And so c is equal to the cube root. Oops, c is equal to the cube root of 30. If this is no calc, that's all you leave it as. If it is calc, you can find... Um, exactly what this is equal to and the added bonus of that is you can make sure it's between 2 and 4 it is in fact 3.107 and so it is between 2 and 4 and so that is going to be our value on to question 2 find the volume of the solid okay it revolved around the x-axis uh, and it's bounded by two functions and so it's x cubed oh the same exact function actually uh, coincidentally uh, and x squared uh, which is going to look a bit flatter uh, and that looks very bad, obviously. So let's zoom in a bit, right? Um, all we care about is the area between them. And so we can exaggerate it a bit. Um, and get this area. Now, where it intersects, you can solve for x squared equals x cubed. Uh, and you're going to get x equals 1 and x equals 0. Uh, and so those are going to be our, our upper and lower bounds. Now we want to revolve around the x-axis. Uh, and well, then we can just use, uh, well, what method should we use? We want to use, uh, hopefully, we want to use vertical rectangles because they're just easier to work with. And vertical rectangles, x-axis, they're perpendicular, meaning we have to use, in this case, the washer method because we're finding the area between two curves. Okay, uh, well, what's the top curve here? It's going to be f of x, bottom curve, uh, well, sorry, Top curve is going to be g of x, which is x squared. Bottom curve is going to be f of x, which is x cubed. So it could wreak havoc with your um, uh, formula a bit, but um, this is going to be your top and bottom function. Uh, and so why is this the top? It seems like x cubed would rise faster than x squared. It does, but in values between 0 and 1, x squared rises faster because something like 0 0.5 squared is just 1 fourth. 0 0.5 cubed, though, is going to be um, 1 eighth, which is smaller. Uh, beyond that, it rises faster, which is why it intersects at x equals 1. Okay, now that we got that out of the way, let's calculate the volume. Uh, the formula is uh, vx in this case, integral from 0 to 1 of uh, pi times the outer radius minus the inner radius. So if we draw an example washer, the outer radius is going to be x squared. So outer radius squared minus inner radius squared dx. Again, this is a very simple um, uh integral is just going to be x to the power of 4 minus x to the power of 6 dx. We can take that pi out and so make it pi times, well, integral of uh, x to the power of 4 is 1 fifth x to the power of 5th minus 1 seventh x to the power of 7th uh, from 1 to 0. Now, if there were different numbers instead of 1 and 0, it would be kind of hard to evaluate, especially taking something to the power of 7. But it's 1 and 0. It's very easy. Uh, it's going to be pi times, okay, uh, 1 to the power of 5 is 1, so 1 fifth minus 1 7th, which you can simplify to 2 over 35 if you were to subtract the two um, fractions, minus and then just 0, because when you plug in 0, you get 0. And so your answer will be 2 over 35 pi units cubed. That should be your answer for the second question. Finally, last question. Um, the base of a solid is the region bounded by the circle x squared plus y squared equals 4. Uh, this is weird because it's not a function, actually. So how are we going to do this? Uh, let's wait and see. It's a cross-sectional method problem. Uh, it's equilateral triangles. 
Now, you probably don't know this. You might if you're in really into math and know a bunch of formulas. But the area of an equilateral triangle given the side length of 1 is s squared root 3 over 4. Why? You can just use a bunch of geometry to figure it out. I'm not here to show you that. I'm just here to show you what you should do. Obviously, on the AP exam, show you show them why it's s squared root 3 over 4. Draw an equilateral triangle. Find the um, you know, 30, 60, 90 triangle and so on. But I'm not doing that here. I'm just telling you that this is the formula you should use. Okay. Uh, how does that help us here? Well, we need a function for our integral. How can we break this into a function? Well, let's only consider the top half, right? Um, so we solve for y. We get y squared uh, is equal to 4 minus x squared. And so y is equal to the square root of 4 minus x squared. And that coincidentally is the top half. If we wanted both, it would be plus or minus square root of 4 minus x squared. We only want the top half, though, because we want a function. Okay, but this only gives us half of the side length. The entire side length of the equilateral triangle is twice that. And so when we're writing our function, it would be two times this. Uh, and so our area function is going to be the side length, f of x squared, root 3 over 4. Uh, and we know that's going to be twice as much as this squared, root 3 over 4, uh, which is equal to 4 times 4 minus x squared, times root 3 over 4, or just uh, root 3, 4 root 3 minus root 3 x squared. Uh, you can factor it however you want, but that's going to be your area function. Very easy to evaluate once again. Coincidence? I think not. Um, and so how do you find the area? It's going to be the uh, integral. So we are going to be use vertical uh, rectangles here because it says perpendicular to the x-axis. Um, so it's going to be integral from a to b. Uh, this uh, you can calculate what it should be. It should be negative 2 and positive 2, since the radius is 2. If it's equal to 4, square root of that is the radius, which is 2. So it's from negative 2 to 2 <clears throat> of um, the area function, which we know is just 4 root 3 minus root 3 x squared uh, dx. And so we can take the integral of this pretty easily. It's going to be 4 root 3 x minus uh, root 3 over 3 x cubed uh, from 2 to negative 2. Now here, you might want to use a calculator. Um, you're going to get, on the top, it's going to be 8 root 3 minus, well, 2 cubed is 8. Um, and so it'll be 8 root 3 over 3. On the bottom, it's going to be negative 8 root 3 uh, plus, because negative 2 cubed is negative 8, 8 root 3 over 3. And so uh, we need to subtract these. And unfortunately, that means none of these cancel out. We have 8 root 3 minus 8 root 3, which is uh, minus negative 8 root 3, which is 16 root 3, uh, minus this minus that, which is 16 root 3 over 3. But we can simplify that a bit. Uh, if you have a common denominator of 3, that'll be 48 root 3 over 3 minus 16 root 3 over 3, which is 32 root 3 over 3 uh, units cubed. Yeah. And that's it for um, unit eight, which was all about applications of integration. And AB students, unfortunately, this is where you uh, are done. No more units for you. Um, good luck on the AP test uh, for you guys. But BC students, thank God you still have two more videos with me. Uh, and that's going to be two more BC only units um, that we're going to have a lot of fun talking about. Uh, and so to BC students, I'll see you in the next video. To AB students, good luck on the test.